The story of the Anglo-Zulu War is dominated by two dramatic and largely unprecedented battles. The initial thrust of British invasion parried and crushed by the Zulu army at Isandlwana, a native victory over an imperial power that shocked the world, followed then by the then lesser known yet no less dramatic holdout of a small collection of plucky British troops against impossible waves of Zulu attackers at Rourke's Drift. This give-and-take vision of the war, with both sides demonstrating in extraordinary and independent fashion those martial values of courage and tenacity in the face of overwhelming struggle, has allowed the Anglo-Zulu War to enter an almost ethereal state of fiction in the imaginations of the public. A cultural isolation where heroic ideals of adventure all too often take the place of real history. This cultural legacy, the martial fantasies surrounding both the Zulu and British is largely owed, I believe, to a pair of films dedicated to each of the battles, the faces and iconic lines from which I'm sure have already appeared in your minds. Zulu and Zulu Dawn. Let's stop your dreaming. Can't you see their spear points gleaming? See but there was more to the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879 than the fantasy of give and take. The bloodshed did not end after Rourke's Drift, but in fact would grow worse. And this video, unlike most that you'll find, will not be about the war's beginning, but about its fiery and painful conclusion. As far as the background is concerned, I'll assume that most of us already know like the basic story behind the war's progression, so I'll just do a very brief overview here. Uh, the British army initially moves in under the General Lord Chelmsford, who makes the fatal mistake of dividing up his army, a large portion of which is then attacked by an overwhelming force of Zulu at Isandlwana and is defeated. Uh, the result of which being not only many thousands of deaths uh, and the uh, major British humiliation on the world stage, uh, but also the loss of many thousands of modern rifles and other weapons, including some artillery, which the Zulu could now use. Uh, keeping in mind that before that point, the majority of the Zulu army, like vast majority, uh, was relying on antiquated spears and shields with only very rarely occasionally being thrown in uh, some usually outdated firearms. Uh, then, of course, uh, after Isandlwana, an element of the Zulu force crosses over the border into British-controlled territory, um, a attacks a supply post there called uh, Rourke's Drift, where despite having a myriad of material advantages, uh, they are thrown back, forced to retreat, that wasn't really a major setback on a strategic level. Like, on the whole, it doesn't really mean much for the war. It's more of like a cultural thing today, I think largely because, again, of the movie and everything. Um, the Zulu plan was never to bring the war outside of their own lands. They knew that a proper counter-invasion would dramatically lessen the opportunity of them uh, to be able to sue for peace against what was ultimately still a vastly more powerful opponent. Um, but that's like the usual story, is it's under water, Rook's Drift, and that's usually the end of it as far as what we hear about. Now, the Zulu did try to sue for peace and would do so continually, practically until the end of the war, but it would never work. Uh, whether unable or unwilling, they never met the full set of British demands, and after, after the humiliation of Isandlwana, the British certainly couldn't just let bygones be bygones. Without getting into, again, the nitty-gritty of it all, this results in the British preparing a much larger force in South Africa for a second invasion of Zululand, including dispatching a new commander, Sir Garnet Wolseley, to finish what Chelmsford had started. Although, through a series of all sorts of wacky shenanigans, uh, he never actually takes that full command uh, while the war is ongoing. Chelmsford was understandably a little desperate to redeem his name after the disastrous first invasion, and commenced with preparing for the second invasion before Sir Garnet could take over from him. And then every time Sir Garnet would uh, send him a letter demanding to know where he was, what his intentions were, and, and of course ordering Chelmsford to report to him so he could take over, Chelmsford would either outright ignore the, the message, he just wouldn't reply, uh, or he would do so in an incredibly vague fashion as far as where he was and what he was doing. Uh, eventually, uh, he actually begins that second invasion without Sir Garnet and 
finally writes back to him uh, a series of communications that basically all just amount to, um, hey, hey, um, I, I know you're here. I'm going to go do a quick thing. No, no, don't worry. It's all cool. It's all fine. It's going to be fine. Fine. Um, I'll see you when I get back. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. I'll be over there. It's all well worth looking into uh, if you're interested at all in, in that role that individual personalities can play in military campaigns. Uh, but for our purposes, suffice to say that despite the fact that he's officially being replaced, this second invasion is still being conducted by Lord Chelmsford. It's also worth pointing out that the invasion itself is only going to consist of a small portion of the total number of troops that are in South Africa at the time, uh, largely owing to the extreme difficulties in actually transporting supplies across that part of the world. Uh, and this means that the second invasion is only actually going to have about 5,000 soldiers, both infantry and cavalry, um, roughly a fifth of which were native troops, as well as uh, 10 cannon and two Gatling guns, which was a new development for the army at the time. So not a particularly large force, but still around twice the size of the one that was present at Isandawana, and with a few very hard-won lessons about fighting the Zulu in mind. Uh, moving forward, Chelmsford would be taking uh, no risks, really. He'd be taking things very slowly, building fortified positions all along his route of march, and certainly not splitting his force up, at least in any dramatic fashion. You can still have different columns moving in different places, but they're all going to be in communication with one another, if that makes sense. Uh, the second invasion began at the start of June 1879, a half year after the first, and then one month later... Zululand would burn. Oh, but before we come to such unpleasantness, I believe it's time for a word on behalf of the video's sponsor, Exter. Because if you're traipsing across the South African countryside with that, well, annoying, let's be honest, smell of burning villages in your nose, well, the last thing that you want to worry about is whether you'll have enough space for all of your entirely legitimately acquired loot in your pack. And you know the best way to make sure that you've got plenty of space? Well, that's right, it's with this sleek, modern wallet design from Exter. This isn't your ratty old bifold, it's a fraction of the size, and yet it can still store up to 12 different cards plus cash. Although, I have to admit, transparency here, the word is still out on whether you could fit that cowhide shield in it that, uh, again, I'm sure you acquired totally legitimately. Um, oh, but uh, if your column just happens to suddenly be ambushed by overwhelming quantities of the enemy, well, then you may not be able to access your ammunition quickly enough because it's, you know, all nailed into boxes, but maybe you can bribe the enemy instead to let you live, and with Extra's quick card access button, it'll ensure you're flashing that plastic well before the Asagai can find its mark. I certainly hope. And hey, I get it. There are some rough conditions out there on campaign. Well, how could you expect such a sophisticated and advanced wallet to hold up? Well, look at this. Compare my wallet, the Daily Carry one, to this brand new piece. Despite being used so regularly, it's retained its shape, its color, and even its functionality in excellent fashion. It's a hearty piece of kit. So if you're in the market for a new wallet, well, I can only recommend Exter in the strongest possible terms. And if you'd like to check them out, then follow the link in the description down below where you can get up to 25% off of your order. Thanks to Exter for sponsoring this entirely legitimate putative expedition. And now, let's look at those conditions on the road to Alundi. <laughs> The beginning of the second invasion was extremely slow going. Not only are there always going to be innate difficulties with moving large bodies of soldiers through hostile terrain, to say nothing of all of their various auxiliaries to keep those soldiers supplied, but the terrain itself was a series of deep gullies and rivers and hills without good roads. All of which was to say nothing, of course, about the ever-present fear of enemy attack. Although, in the end, the Zulu would make no appearance uh, beyond their diplomatic parties bearing gifts of ivory and cattle, attempting to sway Chelmsford to depart. Gifts which were ultimately rejected and sent back the way they came. The diary of Lieutenant Porter of the Royal Engineers provides us with a glimpse into what this steady advance would look like from one of the men who was tasked with clearing the army's route of march. June 18th 
Reveille at 4 a.m. started at 6.15 a.m., marched only five miles, had two difficult drifts to make, hence the short march. In the afternoon, we commenced a fort, where a new depot is to be formed. June 21st. Started half an hour later than usual, as the enemy was reported to be in sight. We had a very steep hill to ascend, then a very steep descent. At the bottom, we had to cross three Badish Dongdas, and a little further on, we had to cross the river. All this necessitated a good deal of work, and though we only went about five miles, we did not get in very early. July 22nd. The road proved very difficult, and we only did three miles. First, we had to ascend a very steep hill, the wagons forming a logger and outspanning as they came up. In the meanwhile, the company was at work about a mile and a half further on, blasting a passage through a rocky cliff. And finally, after almost a month of such maneuvering and marching, June 24th, marched at 6.30 a.m., Road again very difficult. It wound about like a snake up and down steep hills so that progress was very slow and drag ropes in constant use. From the hills, a lundi can be seen, apparently 20 miles off as the crow flies. And while a dedicated army in Europe might close that distance of 20 miles in a day or two, maybe three, it would take Chelmsford over a week. But the steady pace was hardly unexpected, and some sources would defend what on paper seemed to be an unnecessary delay by pointing out those same difficulties which weren't present in more agreeable climates. For example, the American Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper, based out of New York, would follow the ongoings of the war closely, although unfortunately the copy of the paper I've acquired is kind of difficult to read, and so uh, there are some gaps in the account. But all the same, what we can make out uh, from an issue dated September 13th, 1879, wrote, Notwithstanding all that has been written on the subject, it is difficult for those whose experience does not extend beyond the railways and well-made roads of England to appreciate the formidable obstacles. Encumbered with the baggage by such a rugged region as Natal and Zululand, perhaps when the campaign comes to be calmly reviewed, it will be found on the British troops too many impediments. At all events, it is certain that they could not honestly say, as the ragged, shoeless warriors of the First French Republic were wont to say, with bread and steel one can get to China, for they required many things besides bread and steel. And a more direct accounting that we can actually read the whole thing of, uh, of how the soldiers themselves felt about this uh, slow and steady advance, can be found from the book in Zululand with the British throughout the War of 1879, written by Charles L. Norris Newman, a war correspondent with the London Standard, as well as a few other newspapers. He would write, The entire force was in excellent health and spirits, in spite of all delays and difficulties. Contrary to expectation, however, no hostile opposition had been encountered so far. The Zulus were only met with in small bodies, and the sole incidents of the advance have been an occasional skirmish and the burning of kraals by the patrolling parties and scouts. Like I said, this entire time, the Zulu king Ketsweo is trying to sue for peace with the British because even despite his earlier victory, he knew he wouldn't be able to repeat that over and over. He wouldn't be able to actually win a protracted war against the British Empire. But all of his entreaties were rejected because he was unable to meet all of the British demands, which included him surrendering a thousand of his men as prisoners, on top of surrendering all the firearms captured at Isandawana, and all sorts of other more wider reaching political concerns, the implications of which could very well be a video all their own. But it's also worth pointing out that even if Cachuayo himself would agree to all the demands, there is a real risk that the king's men wouldn't and they'd refuse to honor the deal. So even after all the delay, on the 28th of June, the British would outright halt their advance and give Cachuayo an additional day to meet their demands. But ultimately, a deal couldn't be reached and so the march continued. And just a few days later, the British army was within sight of the Zulu capital, the seat of Cachuayo's power, the great kraal of Ulundi. But even still, or perhaps resulting from this proximity, there were some in the British camp who seemed to have doubted that it would come to blows at all, and that before the end, Cachuayo would give in to the demands. In fact, at this last second, the British even reduced their demands to be more amenable, no longer requesting prisoners, but settling for the tribute of firearms, and then again, presumably all the political things that were really unagreeable. The same correspondent wrote of the feeling about the British camp. Upon the first and second, the force remained quiet on the Umvalasi Hill, but the greatest excitement reigned in camp as to whether 
Ketiwayo would or would not send in the guns and rifles captured at Isandalwana. The opinion at headquarters was that he would do so, and there his pacific intentions had all along been believed in, while, on the contrary, throughout the column in general, opinions and hopes alike were that Ketiwayo had only been trifling with and deceiving us. These final terms were that should the Zulu not provide favorable answer by noon on the 3rd of July, then the British would attack. Indeed, the noonday sun rose and fell, yet no surrender was received. The terms having not been met, on the early morning of the 4th of July, the army would once again march, and on the plains of Zululand they would form a mighty hollow square, and before the gates of Alundi, the fate of Katsueo's empire would be sealed. Rather than fighting in long, thin firing lines, as they had done at Isandalwana, the British would form their entire force into a single, hollow rectangle, although it was called a square. The four sides would be made up of infantry, four ranks deep, the front two men kneeling, the rear two standing, so that all of them would be able to fire their Martini Henry rifles with maximum effect. The men wouldn't dig in, or use the classic uh, wagon fort type situation that we're used to seeing in South Africa, uh, a combination of improving their mobility, but much more importantly, to entice the enemy to attack them. And so that means that the men themselves were, in essence, a living wall. And interspersed between them were positioned the ten cannon and two gatling guns, uh, thus protected by the infantry while still having a direct cone of fire. The cavalry rode at first on the outside of the square uh, as they would move forward to skirmish with the enemy and again entice them to attack, before then rushing inside the square once the enemy were flushed out. And protected as well within that square uh, would be, as you'd expect, things like the British general staff, uh, the engineers, any sort of medical staff, uh, and other auxiliaries. Now, as usual, there were many different accounts of this battle, uh, but aside from little differences in like, the exact timing of what happened and when, for the most part, all of these accounts are, are agreeing on the biggest points of how this battle took place. Although, I'm afraid, unfortunately, I was unable to find any Zulu sources on the event. If anyone can point me in a good direction for Zulu accounts of really anything with this war in general, I think that'd be really interesting to look at for future content. Um, but I think that the most effective way of going through it all is just going to be to let the sources speak for themselves, uh, although still not all of the sources paint a, a full picture independently. So what I'm going to do here is string together the words from a few of these different sources and combine them all into one narrative to, to give you that more cohesive sense. Um, if you'd like to read any of these original sources, uh, be sure to label uh, which ones are going with what language. Uh, and as always, all of these, as well as all the other sources that I've used in this video, are all going to be on my website, nativeoak.org, as free-to-read PDFs if you'd like to learn more. Uh, that includes accounts by men who were actually there, it includes the illustrated newspapers, and of course it even includes a full history of the war itself. But for now, the Battle of Ulundi. July 4th. Started in the dark to cross the river. The river was about 50 yards wide, nowhere more than 18 inches deep, the bottom sandy. After we crossed, we commenced at once to ascend through a somewhat broken country towards the open plains where the crawls lay. About two miles from the river, we got into open grassland, and here we formed a large square. The hollow square of the British troops ultimately took up a favorable position, on the level top of a slight knoll, with the ground sloping downwards for several hundred yards away on all sides, and affording no cover from bush. Here, the impending attack was eagerly awaited, and the cavalry were sent out in front in various directions with the object of precipitating the enemy's assault. As the cavalry would soon find, the Zulu were not idle on that long morning either, but were deploying their own forces well in an encircling position, partially hidden by the long grasses of distant fields. About eight o'clock, large bodies of the enemy began to appear, both to the right and left of us, and soon after on our front also. At 8.50 a.m., our cavalry on the front and flanks became engaged, and about ten minutes after, they had to retire to the main body and get inside the square. About this time, the first bullets began to whistle about our heads. 
The whole force of the enemy, numbering at least 15,000 men, rapidly came into sight, in a diminishing circle environing the position, deploying in loose skirmishing order, firing and advancing alternately with great rapidity. This heavy converging fire would have been a trying ordeal and caused great loss to the troops, had the enemy been skilled in the use of their rifles. But even as it was, it was warm enough, and the only matter for surprise is that the casualties were comparatively so few. And so the dark masses environing the British troops quickly closed up around them. By 9.05 a.m., all four faces were attacked, and a heavy fire opened by both sides. About 9.25 a.m., the pressure on the left of the left face began to be rather great, and some engineers were moved there in support. Notwithstanding the somewhat heavy fire to which my company was exposed, we had only a sergeant wounded, and this seemed the more surprising as a good many bullets struck the ground among us. The Zulu warriors were utilizing greater firepower than they'd ever brought to bear before, but they were also moving against a much stronger opponent than they'd faced at Isandalwana. The British were well prepared for them this time. They were in a powerful defensive position. It was also evident that many of the Zulu, while they had modern firearms this time, many of them did, that not all, but many of them did, uh, despite having it, they were lacking in the, uh, shall we say, finer points of modern marksmanship, with the majority of their shots either landing well short of the target or far above their heads. And even though the Zulu had captured at least a few modern artillery pieces at Isandalwana, they didn't know how to operate them. After the battle, according to the history of the Zulu War, the British would retrieve some guns which uh, had shells rammed down without their cartridges of powder, so they weren't able to be fired. Meanwhile, of course, the British themselves, they know what they're doing. They have no such problems with their own guns, which in turn would bring hellfire down upon the Zulu lines. Here they were checked by the heavy, regular, and well-sustained fire from the various regiments which swept the plateau and gradually brought the Zulus to a stand, checked by the withering effects of that hail of bullets which did such murderous execution as all their gallant efforts could not withstand. The boldest and bravest struggled on to within a hundred yards, but vainly, and they could never come to anything like close quarters. This was an expiring effort, and at length the Zulu host wavered, broke, and fled. At this decisive moment, the order was issued to cease firing and the cavalry to mount and gallop in pursuit. The lancers were specially distinguished in the execution done by them among the fugitive Zulus, who, however, made in many cases a desperate though unavailing defense. Numbers of them succumbed to the deadly lance, the saber, and the revolver of the troopers. The British would suffer, by the greatest estimate, only a little over a hundred casualties the Zulu would suffer over 10 times that number. A kraal, in the Afrikaans' word, is in this case uh, referring to an enclosed settlement. Uh, the Zulu referred to them as well as Isibaya, uh, and inside the walls they would uh, consist of uh, concentric rows of huts, usually all circling around a, a central position, a, a central cattle enclosure, uh, or in the case of Ulundi, uh, the entire settlement had six layers of, again, concentric circles of huts um, all around uh, the, the royal residence of the king. The residence was a one-story tall building, so not very large at all, made up of sun-dried bricks. Uh, the inside had wallpaper, glass windows, and pretty fine furniture, uh, but it, would all, it also only had uh, three rooms in it and only a single door. So while maybe a, a very fine home, uh, it was hardly a palace. There was something of a race by the British officers to be the very first ones to reach the king's residence, uh, and by the time they arrived, it and most of Ulundi was completely abandoned, having been stripped of all its valuables. Still, the seat of Katsueo's power, as well as the crawl surrounding it, and every other crawl within a distance of three miles, they were all burnt down. And the destruction wouldn't end there either, as over the coming weeks, the British would be searching for the king, now a fugitive, who had fled after the battle and gone into hiding. Soon after the victory, Chelmsford was finally, properly, replaced by Wolseley, having redeemed at least a part of his reputation. Uh, publicly, he would be praised for the victory and receive accolades for it, 
although privately his superiors were little pleased with his insubordination, and Ulundi was to be his last battle. And so it would fall to Sir Garnet to clean up the mess, which included, most vitally, the capturing of the former Zulu king. For as long as Katsueo lived a free man, even with his capital burnt, his army destroyed, his country occupied, he would pose a threat to British authority in Zululand, and as such peace in South Africa. Sir Garnet Wolseley, finding that setting a price upon Ketuayo's head failed to produce the required article, has taken to hunting the Zulu lion, and the most recent dispatches announce the burning of Amrakago, the immortal rebel's kraal, and the destruction of his powder magazine ten miles distant therefrom. The pursuit is being maintained by human bloodhounds who, according to Archibald Forbes, delight in pig-sticking, as the feats of the 17th Lancers at Alundi have been grimly designated. Ketuayo had notified Wolseley that he was willing to submit and pay taxes, but that the country must be cleared of British soldiers. His messengers were informed that Ketuayo was no longer king, and that he must surrender unconditionally. To the surprise of many, the Zulu proved remarkably resilient in refusing to give up their king, and Sir Garnet's methods would become increasingly intense and controversial in hunting him down. The brutality was not viewed by all with such enthusiasm as the previous account. Why the British soldier was ordered to destroy the shelter, and with the shelter the store of grain food, of some thousands of poor women and children whose husbands and fathers were making their submission, we can no more understand than we can comprehend the strategy by which a large British force was held back for months at the edge of the enemy's country, while commissariat supplies were accumulating sufficient to support a long campaign, the whole work before them being to march a hundred miles and with one fight close up the war. As cited in the history of the war, the orders issued to at least one of the parties that was sent out to hunt Ketsuayo, and so I think a pretty good representation of the sorts of things the British were doing in this area. Uh, for every crawl this party reached, if the people there refused to talk, refused to give up the king or any sort of his last known location or any sort of assistance like that, well then there was a set number of huts that the British would burn down and a set number of principal men and women for them to take prisoners, as well as um, a certain number of cattle that they would have to confiscate. After a short time of this policy being in place, the British actually had to cut down the number of prisoners they were taking because there were just so many of them. Uh, first, they cut it down from eight people of each sex, down to just four, then down to two, and eventually they're just taking one man and one woman. Again, the principal um, figures of the communities. On approaching some of these kraals, the headman came out and offered the passes or papers, promising protection given them on surrendering their arms. But the unhappy people received another lesson on the text, when we give a promise, we will perform it. And were told that their papers were worthless now, they must tell where the king was, or suffer like the rest. One of the officers concerned in carrying out these orders exclaimed at the time with natural indignation, I don't care what may be said of the necessity of catching Ketsueo. Necessary or not, we are committing a crime in what we are doing now. After a full month of this destruction, through burning property, bribing officials, flogging prisoners, and even threatening to shoot people outright for not complying, the location of Ketsueo was discovered. The now former Zulu king was captured, made prisoner, and exiled from Zululand to Cape Town. And so finally the process of ruling, and not merely conquering Zululand, could begin. Sir Garnet Wolsey's first act in this direction was to call together as many of the principal Zulu chiefs and officials as could be found, and to address them upon the situation. This meeting took place at Alundi on the 1st of September, the day after the captive king's departure for Port Dumford. About 200 Zulus, including two of Ketsueo's brothers, and his prime minister, Minyamana, had responded to the summons, and seating themselves in rows four deep with the principal chiefs in front, a few paces from the flagstaff at Sir G. Worsley's tent, waited in perfect silence. When Sir Garnet, with his staff, at last appeared, he addressed the assembled chiefs through Mr. John Shepstone, who accompanied him as interpreter. He informed them that it was six years that very day since Ketsueo was crowned king of the Zulus, and that he was now carried away, never to return. This, he told them, was in consequence of his having broken his coronation promises, and having failed to make and keep such laws amongst his people as the Queen of England could approve. 
Therefore, his kingdom was taken from him and would now be divided amongst a number of chiefs who would be expected to rule with justice. The kingdom was divided up into a series of sub-kingdoms, basically little principalities under the chiefdom of pro-British rulers and under direct British supervision in the form of a resident agent who was to act as the middleman between the British colonial authorities and the chiefs. And whenever some business concerning a Briton would arise, and presumably any European, the chiefs would defer to that agent who would have authority there. And not all of the chiefs were Zulu either. Some of them came from other African peoples. One was even a white man, a certain Mr. John Robert Dunn. Nor did these chiefs have complete control as regards their own people either. They were to abide by certain regulations. And while some of those regulations, I would argue, were objectively good things, very modern and forward-looking things to be put into place, well, many other policies were very plainly designed with uh, British advantage in mind. They were intended to completely dismantle the highly militaristic society which had been built by Shaka himself so many years ago. And the thing is that those two concerns aren't necessarily exclusive from one another either. And so they, when paired with the extraordinarily violent means by which the regulations were required, they really are a, a perfect encapsulation, I think, of, of the strange and nuanced morality of empire, or lack thereof, depending on how you look at it. We'll get to that. Uh, it could result in such horrible terror, such evil things, as well as some good. All of it depending on your perspective and what specific events you're dealing with at what time, how you're looking at it and such. But in any case, on paper, these regulations included that no life could be taken by the king without a trial that no trivial offenses would be punished by anything worse than fines, uh, again, as opposed to something far worse. Uh, the young men would be allowed to marry whomever they wished, with the consent of the woman's parents, of course, as opposed to the former system uh, by which men were only ever allowed to marry after certain military qualifications, military considerations, had been met. And again, that sort of gets into the idea that they are dismantling the uh, militarized society that had been put into place by Shaka all those years ago. And uh, also that the, of course, hunting out of witches would also be forbidden. All of these policies, to greater or lesser degrees, I'm sure that we can all agree were good things. These are reforms that a modern nation needs to make to ensure the happiness and the prosperity of its people. These were forward-looking policies that were good things, whether the Zulu wanted them or not. But there were also other policies as well, such as no Zulu being able to own a firearm or ammunition, and more importantly, that no stores would be permitted to land on Zulu soil, which was designed ultimately to prevent smuggling, arms smuggling, um, you know, allowing the Zulu to raise military forces and all that, but which would of course have the result of also cutting them off from establishing any sort of commerce on their own. All of that commerce would have to go through British territory so they could ostensibly make sure there's no rifle hidden underneath all the grain or whatever. Uh, and most notably, again, uh, alongside that, that the Zulu would no longer be able to have a standing army. Uh, now, as well, of course, another very important thing to keep in mind here is that just because something was made policy doesn't mean that it was always followed. And I think that if you really want to get into the, into a proper moral discussion of what all this means, you really have to dive in to exactly what those regulations and their enforcement would actually look like on the ground. But, you know, aside from, you know, from all of those concerns, the fact that it's entirely possible that there were abuses of power. Were there structures in place to prevent those abuses of power, like by the British or by anyone else? In fact, were there structures in place which actively permitted abuses of power? All those sorts of things, like, you know, just because the British say, hey, you can't be killing people anymore, doesn't mean that that's what's actually happening. It doesn't even mean that the British themselves weren't doing killing or the Zulu or whatever. 
it's complicated, right? And all of that is a subject for another time. But at least on the surface level, you can see how on one hand, some of these changes are, are good things, objectively good things. But on the other, all of it, whether it was good or bad, was specifically designed to limit Zulu authority, to change their society to fit British needs, and to defend British interests in Zululand, military, economic, social, all that, even when those reforms did come to the detriment of the natives. And of course, at the end of the day, all of this, it wasn't the end of violence in South Africa either, even the end of violence in Zululand. There would be future tribal conflicts and wars, and even Katsueo would return at one point as a king over a much reduced Zululand, again under the British thumb. The story goes on, it gets complicated, it always does. But all that, and again, all of those moral complexities of empire, they're a story for another time. My, my basic point is, I don't want you to look at the incredible violence of the first half of this video and be like, oh, you see, the British were all evil, or the reforms that they made afterwards and say, oh, you see, empire was ultimately for the best. From this video alone, you cannot draw either conclusion, is what I would say. They did really good things, they did really bad things. Depends on what you want to look at to see which one is worse. Uh, in any case, <laughs> I hope that you have all enjoyed this look into the Battle of Ulundi, because I think it's an event that is little appreciated in history. It's all too easy, it's all too common for us to look at the Anglo-Zulu War specifically and solely through um, these romanticized lens uh, of the films, where fans, as horrible as it is to use a word like that in this context, can watch the movies and walk away with this romanticized, idealized vision of martial fantasy, where the entire affair was an even competition, like a sport really, between the brave and noble warriors on, I on either side, uh, each of whom, you know, they did their best in a difficult situation, they come away with it, oh, they're a bit bloodied, but they have their laurels, they did a good job, the glory, the pride, the heroism, the greatness, the honor, the blah, 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 blah. But what we don't see in the films, what we don't have emphasized, what we don't talk about in popular culture, it's what came after that give and take of Isanda Wan and Rourke's Drift. We don't talk about the reality of the war, of the burning of Ulundi, and the death of the Zulu Empire. A living wall on every side, the hollow square opposed that tide, in Sendula in vain defied, that memory awoke their pride on that day at Ulundi. And each one showed what he could do, short service boys right boldly slew, and showed themselves brave men and true on that day at Ulundi. A British cheer, it rends the air, the brave foe breaks in wild despair. Now every soldier breathes a prayer that he may live to have a share in the burning of Ulundi. Old England's honor is at stake. Her sons stand firm nor think to break. They heard her urging words that spake on that day at Ulundi. The living wall is opening wide, and forth the gallant lancers ride, for death or glory is their pride, and Bueller's horse is at their side. And now they ride victorious, their ghastly work is quickly done. Edgeless soldiers death has won, and England lost another son. All honor to the glorious. Where crawls were burning all around, where dead lay scattered on the ground, where England stood victorious crowned, was many a bitter relic found of wild in Sandula. Perchance some soldier heaved a sigh, and wished a brother then was nigh, a brother who knew how to die at wild in Sandula. Where has not England's banner spread? Where does an English soldier tread, and laurels do not crown his head? Where are not buried English dead, now even at Alundi? At last poor Chelmsford, worn and tired, with racking brain and wounded pride, to victory has turned the tide. All honor to Alundi. Thank you all for watching, and to the Native Oaks patrons for their support. Until the next time, dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.